again, we're going to go into something that's maybe not as precise, but again, but again, and re-emphasizing what Jim Ayer said, if you can do this, take them apart, feel them. I, I, and this, this is just me, but I really need to see these things to, to touch these things and to uh, make them fit into the uh, different uh, sockets uh, so that I can see what they actually look like. But that, that may just be me. Some people don't need that. Uh, what we have, and we talk about, talk, start out in the book, I think, with this stuff, with just starting with the clients, with the thin clients, and they kind of just jump in. I want to go back and be sure that's where it actually starts customizing uh, comp types of common business uh, clients is what this this one is called and common business clients what you might see in a business obviously and the first one is what's called a thin client I've got some pictures here in just a second but a thin client is a machine that doesn't have any moving parts doesn't have a hard drive it has some memory very little memory uh, what it has, and we use these things in one of the organizations where I work, uh, a Citrix client, where we, I might as well, let me go down to the picture here. What a thin client looks like, this is a WISE. They're one of the uh, manufacturers of the, uh, of the thin clients, obviously. What you're going to see over here says Citrix receiver. That's what you'll see on your uh, workstation uh, your thin client workstation screen. The applications don't run on the device itself. They run on a server at a remote location. So what we have is the ability to centrally manage uh, the uh, applications. There are a couple of ways on it. Want to want to want to sketch one that we used uh, to utilize some old machines that really couldn't do anything but first a look at the bullets here that performs most or all of the functions on its own oh i can thick clients okay let's restart thick clients let's do thin clients then we'll come back to thick clients thin clients are these guys uh that i will get to thin clients relies on other computers and servers for programs processes uh, services. So a thin client is the thing that I just described uh, can be highly specialized based on a job role. What we can do is only allow users to have the things that they need. A uh, computer must meet the minimum requirements to run the selected operating system. Uh, use it, uses basic applications that can be accessed over the internet or any network. Uh, a thin client would be maybe when you're using, uh, uh, maybe if you have a, an Outlook.com account where, you, where you're accessing uh, Office Online or if you're using uh, Google Docs, uh, those things we could do with a thin client because they have the, uh, the typically are going to have the Citrix client which would connect to a Citrix uh, server uh, that has the applications running on it or it may just have a web browser. If we have the web browser, then we could get to uh, Outlook.com. We could get to Google and use Google Docs. So the thin client, very, very uh, limited physical capability. Uh, computer uses the basic applications. Let's say RAM is used to run the application on the server, no hard drive. That It's going to be uh, started uh, from a, a solid state memory of some sort not an SSD, but just some memory that, that has it in it. These are specialized uh, devices. Uh, fast network to access the servers hosting the application uh, might require specialized software in order to access it. Uh, the computer may require a specific browser in order to run uh, web-based applications, but a thin client, small device, no moving parts, what you plug into is a keyboard and a mouse, and I didn't do the backside, and then, then it has a, a video connector on the backside of it, and maybe speakers also. So thin clients used to run applications at a remote location to run them. Now let's go back to the thick clients because I can't read the, the uh, 
the slide. Uh, performs most or all of the tasks functions on its own. It's a desktop that we've been talking about. It's what you have at home. It's probably what you have uh, right there if you're at uh, one of the uh, LeaderQuest sites. It's, it's a, a desktop computer, a Dell, a HP, a Build Your Own, or whatever else is going to be there. Uh, so the, the requirements uh, must meet the, requ the standard requirements for running selected operating system. Uh, it's got to have enough resources to run Windows or to run Linux, uh, whichever operating system you're running. Full application versions are installed and run directly from the client machine. You get a copy of Microsoft Office, install it on the computer. So the distributed computing is what this is called. The other one we're using centralized computing. We started out in the computing world with centralized computing. We went to distributed computing and now we're going back to centralization with uh, thin clients. To manage the thin clients, we can manage all of the applications. Vanish to thin clients, when people save files, they're saved centrally so that they can be backed up more readily. So if something happens, they can be restored. Thick clients, advantage is you don't have to have as fast of a network. Uh, you don't have to have as big a server. You don't have to have as much software to support it. Uh, the Citrix thin client we talked about, you had, we had to have a Citrix client, you had to license a Citrix client, and then you also had to license a uh, Microsoft remote desktop uh, connection in order to do it. You actually could have done all that with a remote desktop, but Citrix puts it together very nicely, makes it easy for people to use. If data is stored locally, uh, then access to the storage locations is, is a is a required with a constant pathway to the data uh, to storage locations. Uh, stored locally, it's there. The disadvantage is how you're going to back the information up because users, count me as among them, not real good about backing stuff up. That's why I like to store things in a cloud on a Dropbox or a or Google Drive or, or a Box or one of those things. The data is stored on the network, then a consistent path should be established to the storage location with proper security implementation implementation and I got these things copied wrong didn't I but if it's stored locally it is on the local drive if it's stored uh, on the network and when we talk about stored on the network we have this thing called map drives which was alluded to in one of the questions and a map drive is just simply your home directory that's stored centrally on a server uh, many most uh, Enterprises are going to use something like that so that, that so that you can back up all of the uh, data. Uh, it's very difficult to back up three or four hundred uh, desktops. It's pretty simple to back up a, a large drive that's centrally stored on the server. So the standard thick client, standard off-the-shelf retail system, onboard drive for local storage, act either as a standalone workstation, a network attached client. Uh, desktop applications, typical business use where we would have Word, Excel, uh, maybe PowerPoint, maybe uh, Access, probably not Access because most of them don't. Uh, a uh, email client, those sorts of things would be the applications. Uh, hardware, the requirements of the operating system, and it's most common open source OSs. Most common, we have open source OSs our Linux and again picture of the thin client what one actually looks like not much to it they're very lightweight they don't have anything in them either you're not going to store anything locally if you want to do anything uh, then you're going to uh, do it on a remote server uh, at ECPI in Roanoke we use a uh, thin clients or actually use Citrix use thin clients to uh, do run their applications and, and management people did to run their applications uh, and all on a server centralized at Virginia Beach so it doesn't have to even be local as long as you've got the network connectivity and then we did all that thin client uh, typically smaller form factor systems uh, may or may not have local storage typically it doesn't doesn't uh, can boot from a remote OS 
so that means that the operating system can be stored someplace else on a server. It can boot from it. Uh, usually connected to a network uh, for storage. Remote computing uh, may run applications from a network server. The desktop can be loaded as a virtual desktop. And while we're talking about virtual desktop, let me put a blank slide in here and do one of my bad sketches for you if I can find my pen and get my pen running here. At ECPI, we had a whole bunch of old computers. So we had computers here that we could run XP on. We wanted to upgrade them to 7. They didn't have the hardware capability to do that. What we did have was some servers that the headquarters activity had sent to us. So what we did was virtualize. We made virtual computers on these servers. And what we did on the old hardware was install a real basic, really, really basic, very small uh, Linux client on it. So with the Linux client, it would boot, the, the machines could run Linux no problem. So it would boot to the Linux client, and then we did, would do a remote desktop, and we'll talk about remote desktop here in a little bit. We would do a remote desktop to one of these virtual machines. So now we're running Windows 7, in some cases Windows 10, on a machine that could just barely run XP because of the uh, virtual, and the, well, that's what they're talking about when they talk about virtual desktop. The virtual desktop, virtual computer, virtual applications, virtual just means it's someplace else, not physical. At some place it has to be physical. And on these guys, we had a whole bunch of uh, virtual machines running on one physical device. Problem there is physical device goes down, you lose all of your uh, virtual machines. Everybody goes down at the same time. But virtual desktops, uh, that's what a thin client uh, does. Virtualization workstations, good lead in. Huh? Windows, Linux, Solaris, a number of different virtual, virtual, virtual platforms. Uh, requirements for these things, as much RAM as the motherboard will support. And I think I alluded to, we, we used virtual machines for instruction. Students had their own virtual machine. When we're doing a Windows machine, Windows 7, they had their Windows 7 machine. When they did a Linux class, they had their Linux machine, their own Linux machine that they could uh, work on from home or they could work on uh, in class so that we could do that with virtualization. The server that we were running, I think, had somewhere around 128 gig of RAM so that we could do that. The issue that we got into is that if everybody tried to do the, something at the same time, and put a big demand on the hard drives. Hard drives, hard drive access became the limitation on these things. Lots of RAM. RAM utilization is about 90%. Uh, maximum number of CPU cores that are possible we want on these things. We had, it was a dual quad core machine, and I've forgotten, all, I've forgotten the rest of the specifics on it. But what we're doing with virtual workstations running the operating system multiple times on a server and what we're doing there is uh, sharing the hardware with these things and I'll jump back to the uh, uh, to the to the uh, virtualization OS of the local PC will be the VM host or virtualization client software is installed on the PC if the VM is hosted on the server I've shown you and let me break drag this thing over here again just a second You've seen me run a virtual machine. We did, and we'll do some other things with it. But this one is running on it. That's they're not running right now. It's got a Windows Server uh, 2008 on it, GNS3 virtual machine, uh, which is used for some uh, Cisco simulation. And uh, this afternoon, so we can look at the troubleshooting tools in uh, Linux. It's got a Linux machine. They all can run on this piece of software, which is VMware Workstation. The virtual machines, and I could have multiples running at the same time, if I've got enough resources, that's back to as much RAM as you can get, uh, as much processing power as you can get, 
uh, fast network connections for server side and fast work fast uh, network connections is when I am outside connecting to one of these devices inside with this image shows is that we can have a uh, Windows this is a Windows Linux or Solaris this is going to be the uh, VM VM host virtual machine host so it can host a Windows machine a Linux machine and here we have a Solaris machine and that's what I was trying to show you with my VMware workstation that I can run Windows on it I can run Linux on it you can't run Macs on it they don't work with virtualization but Windows and Linux no problem uh, the client side virtualization terms the virtual machine manager creates and manages the virtual machines starts modifies and stops them and that's what uh, that's what this thing is is the virtual machine manager I can start them and these are and I can actually pause them and these are paused right now and they will start back uh, where where I left off so any any thing that was running or that was in progress will still be running and be and it and be in progress and this is says resume this machine we can configure what we want to run on it, how much memory I wanted to run how many processors the hard disk here uh, CD-ROM this one actually is a live what's called a live machine it's a bootable uh, DVD uh, the network adapter USB controllers all of the hardware that we want on the device when I go back up here to my Windows machine it's got two gig Windows requires more Linux doesn't require nearly as much resource as a Windows machine does but virtual machine the VM uh, created uh, from set aside memory and disk space it it gets to use the physical memory the physical disk space the physical processor in order uh, to run on it uh, uses a virtualized hardware is installed from a physical media you install it just like you would if you were installing it on a uh, a piece of hardware hypervisor is another name for the uh, virtual machine manager Hypervisor name for the virtual machine manager typically going to be associated with a computer that is dedicated to running virtual machines. Uh, Windows has them, uh, VMware has them. Uh, there are some others that I can't. The VirtualBox, a number of virtual virtualization softwares are available. The host PC runs the operating system whatever supports running the guest OS the guest OS are the virtual machines uh, so the host PC runs the standard operating system uh, within that operating system a virtual machine manager uh, host one or more virtual machines uh, each machine is running as a guest OS uh, connection to the physical physical hardware or pass from the guest OS to the virtual machine manager to the host PC so it can use those things uh, you can run more than one obviously VM at a time on a machine if you have enough resources and resources are a big deal this is the Oracle VirtualBox manager looks a little different than the one that I showed you each of the uh, systems each of the manufacturers each of the uh, uh, vendors is going to be a, look a little bit different they're all doing basically the same thing uh, virtualized hardware support a video VGA for older virtual machine managers 3d acceleration on some of the new ones USB and, and mine had USB input uh, devices keyboard mouse uh, almost any virtual machine manager uh, storage devices uh, we could plug in a USB drive for instance on the physical machine and then connect it to the virtual machine we can at least you can in the VMware you can use the physical drive save things directly to the physical drive and copy things directly from the physical drive onto the uh, virtual machines that's something that's hasn't been around forever it's happened uh, a little bit later uh, when I started that when I started doing virtualization one of the other things that you could do we'll back off here in a little bit a little bit if we go into your file file new virtual machine we go next we, we can build it I'm not gonna actually build it but it's reading the disk 
what do we want to do this thing I will start the operating system and on and on and on and on I will cancel this file and here what here's what I was looking looking for also virtualize a physical machine if you have a computer your computer for instance maybe you want to virtualize it and run it as a virtual machine so that if gets a virus you can always go back in time with these things with a virtual machine so you can virtualize a physical machine if you wanted to transform one from a physical to a virtual we had done that with several servers it was just quicker to do it than to reinstall everything uh, the USB cannot be used by the host OS and the VM at the same time uh, they can access it individually each of them can access it but only one at a time uh, networking uh, wireless networking may be remapped to a virtual wired NIC and that is one of the I guess kind of bugaboos there are sometimes I would wanted to use the virtual NIC there are only a few specialized ones where it will actually virtualize as a wireless otherwise it's going to use a, a, a wired NIC wired networking not a big problem and this says check the specifics for the VMMs you're considering to determine how well the hardware in your host PC will be supported VMware runs Linux very well Windows runs Windows really really well uh, Linux not so good in in the uh, in the GUI under the GUI or the desktop not a problem hypervisors that bare metal uh, it used a hypervisor that does not use a host operating system it is the operating system fire faster uh, used for virtual servers uh, is a VMware OS XI is a is a is a, an operating system that only runs virtual machines on it and then once we create a hypervisor and create the virtual machines we use a thin client uh, virtual desktop infrastructure in order to have the workstation available to us uh, VMs run on servers hardware to connect to the thin clients via the network easy to manage but not designed for multimedia intensive uses tried that once don't try to watch a video uh, on one of these things they don't work very well uh, Hyper-V manager this is what Microsoft's Hyper-V manager looks like uh, the virtual machine manager we just saw kind of they all kind of look alike they all work a little bit differently uh, benefits purposes reduce this is the expenses for hardware and cooling when we and I and I showed you and I drew pictures I talked about the, the computers on the shelf the servers on the shelf we actually had that we virtualized I don't know, eight or ten servers and put them on a bigger server obviously but virtualize them so instead of having eight or ten computers in there running blowing hot air out we had like three uh, centralized management but we also had centralized failure if, if we had an issue with them uh, support for multiple installations of an OS on a single device we had several well, actually yeah that's the same thing we had a, we had a bunch of different kinds we had Windows servers running we had uh, Linux servers running on the uh, on the uh, host machines and ours were all running uh, Hyper-V uh, from Microsoft. Uh, support uh, multiple installations, run different VMs to perform different tasks. Uh, support legacy operating systems without dedicating hardware. Uh, scaling uh, server infrastructure to match workload without purchasing new hardware. That was what we did with our workstations that were really not very strong. We were running a, a real basic Linux thin client on them they became a thin client they didn't have much memory they didn't have much hard drive they didn't have much uh, of anything they didn't have a NIC and they had the ability to boot into Linux and then Linux would and it actually was set up to automatically connect to a uh, virtual machine so that when the user sat down at a uh, desktop they thought they were running on a Windows 7 machine not a Windows XP machine uh, so we could scale as as we needed more virtual machines we could add more virtual machines we didn't have to go new hardware the problem with that is it's easy to get uh, 
a lot more machines than you probably actually need because I would just make another virtual machine. Easier disaster recovery as long as you have backups. Uh, it also, and I guess if you think about it, it's easier to have a disaster because if the one server goes down with all of the machines on it, then everything's down. Now there are uh, obviously ways, and when you think about RAID, we would want to mirror the uh, the devices so that if one of the servers went down, we could keep running uh, with the other ones. Central management of the uh, of the VM virtual machine images, we can update them all at the same time. You can install Linux into a VMM from an ISO. Uh, use a bootable me media to run Linux as a live CD. Uh, some ones that you can get are here https get fedora.org uh, ubuntu download ubuntu and these are linux uh, versions uh, linux different linuxes and free virtual machine managers uh, virtual box uh, linux or unix vms uh, vmware player is free vmware workstations not uh, VMware Player, work, it works about the same as VMware Workstation. They have quite as much capability, but it will play them. You can find a number of virtual machines already made on the internet if you if you want to play with these things and search for them. And you just search for you know like Linux uh, VMware virtual machine. You can download them, extract them, and and, and, and import them into your. Uh, uh, V, uh, virtual, uh, yeah, your virtual machine manager. Resource requirements, these are not hard and fast. These are things that we kind of would like. Uh, fast multi-core, uh, four or more processor, as much RAM as possible, 16 gig plus, depending on how many machines you're going to be using. And you can find guidelines on how many how much memory and how much processors is going to take. Processor, we never really had a whole lot of problem with, although we say, oh, yeah, we need to be really, really, really fast. But it's like everything else. Processor goes up, goes down, not everything else. But processing, processor demand goes up. When you do something, you start an application, it goes up. Just like when you go to the Internet, your networking demand goes up. When you go to the Internet, you get the page, and then it kind of sits there and waits while you read the page. It, it, it's not. Uh, going back and forth all the time, but as much RAM as possible. 64-bit uh, operating systems are going to uh, manage more RAM than 32-bit, obviously, and you want to be—you really do want to be in a 64-bit operating system with this. BIOS or UEF firmware virtualization support enabled, and most of the devices come with it not enabled. You need to turn that on. Multiple displays. Maybe, yeah, you can you can have multiple displays if you're going to look at virtual at, at, at multiple VMs at the same times. Uh, some VM v, virtual machine managers require a CPU to support second level address translation. Uh, check hardware uh, with CPU, Z, AMD, or Intel utilities or core info. But what they're saying is check the hardware and to be sure that you can do the virtualization. Keeping them secure, uh, monitor the network traffic. The other, I guess, choke point on VMs probably going to be the uh, the NIC because physical machines typically don't have one NIC. You have, may have multiple NICs and you may put some of the VMs on one and some on the other, but the virtual NIC is going to be connected to a physical NIC. Uh, methods vary according to how the VMs connect to the network monitoring the traffic. Uh, backups, uh, VM aware backup utilities, security. Uh, look for the v look for virtual machine managers to use sandboxing. Sandboxing is isolation of each machine so that they don't talk to each other across the virtual machine manager. That's been one of the issues uh, with them is is how do you keep them secure? Uh, best security practice update. Uh, the OS used for each machine, just like you would update a physical machine. Firewalls, anti-malware to protect them. Uh, VPN for remote administration. Unneeded connections between VMs. So these are things you need to treat the virtual machine just like you would treat a physical machine. And that, that kind of takes care of those. The other 
uh, more uh, talking about yeah more, more other s specialized devices uh, graphic design CAD CAM workstation drawing ones uh, CAD CAM design workstation uh, optimized for graphics 3D rendering uh, raw photo editing it needs a powerful processor in order to do those things a high-end video card and monitor an ATX motherboard maximum RAM uh, for multiple uh, hard drives DVD, do blu-ray a big uh, power a P, a P, a big power supply PSU power supply unit uh, when we talk about hard drives here optimized for graphics and rendering and and those sorts of things uh, multiple hard drives we may want to think about RAID 0 because RAID 0 is going to be the fastest one video editing workstations you notice they just and, and there are a lot of similarities uh, audio and video uh, specialized audio card specialized video card large hard drive speed optimized again speed optimized think RAID 0 two or more displays uh, when we're doing these things anytime you're doing editing probably want to to think about two or more displays I think two or more displays I think about now just running a regular machine this is one that, that obviously came from a, a different uh, vendor but uh, the features of the high performance motherboard CAD and audio uh, video editing uh, uh, see, SSD here DDR mem DDR4 memory so sockets a PCIe video slots for the nvidia sli and amd crossfire so uh, we're going to have lots of memory fast memory fast video uh, gamers are also going to want to have gaming pcs gamers are going to want to have fast machines also uh, i was at best buy to do something else the other day and i was walking through the computer stuff and said you know a few years ago, we go through here and say, "Well, I needed this, and I needed this, and I needed this." But now, unless you're specializing high-end uh, applications, the basic off-the-shelf one's probably uh, pretty, pretty good. Going to do it. Going to do a pretty good job for us. But uh, gaming PC, high-end, uh, C three three gig or better, multi-core, uh, unlocked clock multiplier, which means we can overclock it. Eight meg or larger uh, L2 and L3 cache, and those are the uh, static RAM. And this is not gig; this is in fact meg. So static RAM, very small on the uh, on the uh, CPU chassis itself. Uh, motherboard with multiple uh, PCIe uh, 16 uh, slots, PCIe uh, uh, 16 lane slots to accommodate multi monitor. Uh, surround display, crossfire, or multiple GPU 3D rendering. GPU is a graphics processing unit. High-end video with onboard GPU suitable for 3D rendering. High frame rate, better than normal sound. Cooling system, uh, heat pipe, liquid cooling uh, to handle the overclocking uh, that the gamer is going to want to do because they're going to want the processor to be as fast as possible as much memory as possible and they're going to want really fast video uh, high performance video card and these guys actually pay more for a video card than I pay for a computer if you look at the price of some of these things they are really really very expensive but on this one this video card has a PCIe here the uh, 16 lane slot a DVI a DVID and an HDMI port, a display port, and here the, the six is a dual slot cooler. So they, and it's got a big, it's got a fan on it, also a big fan on it uh, to cool the card. Um, this liquid cooling on this thing, uh, CPU uh, water block with a term with uh, yeah thermal material on this one, a radiator, uh, a cooling fan, and then a water uh, block lockdown mechanisms here to lock down the, the, the water block. So liquid cooling for gaming PCs again overclock lots of high-speed information on this Why would I mean, of course why would gaming PC only use megabyte instead of gigabyte because that's cache memory the cache memory 
is really, really high speed memory. That's not very much of it. It's going to have in RAM, it will be gigabytes, as many gigabytes as you can get. But this one this is a little deceiving, I think, on this thing. Eight mega, megabytes, and let's go in here and emphasize the fact that it is L2 or L3 cache memory. Cache memory, not very much of it, very high speed. It connects directly to the CPU. The RAM, where it would have multiple gigabytes, would be, and they, they don't, it's not really addressed in this slide, but uh, you would have as much RAM as the uh, as the machine could handle also. Does that make sense? Is overclocking bad? If you don't overclock it too much, uh, you can overclock to the point, and then if you go back to some of the troubleshooting stuff at the end of the uh, chapters, overclocking can cause overheating, which can cause shutdowns, can cause... Uh, inconsistent performance of the machines so is it necessarily bad no if you overclock too much can it be yeah so yeah a lot of people overclock I've always thought that AMD actually I think they they actually overclock their processors by default but that's just my opinion high performance RAM and we talked about the DDR with the heat spreaders this is trying to represent a heat spreader it's just a metal cover over the ram chips the, the heat spreader spreads the heat out so that it can dissipate quickly instead of uh, just just the on the chips itself much like the heat sink on the uh, cpu with the fan on these don't have fans on but they're going to run air across it so they have heat spreaders on them did that did i did the did, did i answer the overclocking question which is it necessarily bad? No, it's not necessarily bad. You just have to be careful about it. Home theater PC, uh, surround sound, SPDIF, which is going to be the uh, video. SPDIF is uh, uh, one one of the connectors. Is probably going to be a, a, a fiber connector to do that. HDMI output for HD movies. Uh, look for audio compatibility. Uh, home theater PC uh, form factor to accommodate uh, small installation spaces and then a TV tuner uh, to enable recording of programs and maybe watching of programs. Uh, home theater PCs, we're going to have a picture of the motherboard here in a second, built specifically for home theater purposes. Uh, so most of the required elements are built right into the system. They generally include a TV tuner card, and we had that in one of the labs. A cable card, we had that in one of the labs. Optical disc player, we had to connect that in one of the labs. HDMI output for the high definition uh, video and audio. Uh, maximum RAM supported by the motherboard. A video card with both uh, GPU graphics uh, processing unit and HD capabilities, Bluetooth, wireless. Uh, for remotes or input devices and I also think wireless capabilities so that you can connect to your uh, uh, internet. Uh, home theater PC PC mini ITX board and you can see here the uh, heat sink over the processor, the HDMI and the USB ports and, and other ports that are available on it. Uh, and these, and we've got the, the keyboard and the mouse, PS2. These, this is what a PS2 connector looks like. A VGA, three rows, 15 pins, HDMI label. Uh, USB, uh, USB 3 is going to be blue. We also have some USB 2 ports over here. RJ45 for the internet connection and then the uh, uh, audio. And that's, that's not going to be a, a high level audio. That's going to be kind of standard. Uh, uh, logarithmic or um, standard video or audio uh, home connect home server home server PCs this is not home theater but home server we've got a, a server itself that we're going to stream going to store videos movies pictures files on them we can stream it to your uh, smart TV to your uh, Roku uh, device or, or or to other computers that are maybe connected to it 
various computing devices on the home, uh, manages file print sharing, uh, wireless network connectivity is usually going to be available on these things. They're optimized multimedia presentation streaming, uh, large file downloads, movies, uh, file server capabilities, concurrent processing during the download, uh, print sharing, may have a rate array, gigabit NIC for the uh, fast uh, networking capability, and then a, a, a multi-terabyte secondary storage if you're going to have a lot of, uh, of movies on it. A friend of mine sent me a drive, two terabytes worth of movies, and now I'll watch a whole lot of them, but lots of movies and uh, TV shows that are available locally. I don't have to worry about the internet. I can stream them within the house itself. Can't you set it to stream versus having, yes. Can you set it up to uh, stream versus having a separate server for the stream movies? Yeah, a couple different ways. Uh, Roku, I, I've become a real Roku fan. Uh, I bought a Roku TV. All I do is click on Netflix, stream the movie. Click on Amazon because we have a Prime account. Watch the TV shows or the uh, or the movies that are there. So each it, it depends on you know it's kind of pick your poison, whichever you want to do. Uh, but the uh, uh, home the home theater PC. And actually, even the smart TV, you know, I can set up to do that but by just simply buying a card where it costs about, what, $40 or $50 to do that. Probably a lot cheaper than setting up the home theater PC, but whatever people want. Some people really get into those things. Does that answer that question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, processes, virtualized processing software interfaces on these things. This is a piece of free software that you may want to get. It's freeware. Well, I'm going to read you the note that I have here. Bell, Act, Bell Arc System Advisor is a freeware web-based tool that's based on Bell Arc's commercial system. Uh, it will give you the hardware information about your machine, tell you whether you're lacking updates. It will tell you what your key codes are for your software. If you ha if you fail to record those, you can find it out in there. It's free. Uh, you just you just need to, to uh, ask Google for Bell Arc Advisor. Uh, it it is one of those free things that that is worth getting. So now we come to the end. Uh, have you had any experience with any workstation or server setups presented in this lesson and? What types of custom client setups do you think you will encounter in, in your role as an A-plus technician? I'm going to stop recording now and see, or, well, before we stop recording, are there questions or comments?